There's a lovely new skirmish wargaming rulebook out from Osprey Games. Uh, that's been out for a few weeks now. Called The Silver Bayonet. A war game of Napoleonic Gothic horror. It's accompanied by a beautiful North Star Miniatures 28mm range of uh, metal miniatures. But I thought to myself, I don't have any Napoleonic miniatures. And I don't need to buy any more miniatures, really. But... I often cast my mind around to what I know is lying in storage because I've got this wider program at the back of my mind of getting miniatures out of random boxes that have been sitting there and making some kind of use of them, even if they get a game or two with some kind of system. And these Osprey agnostic rule systems are fantastic just for that. And I did some digging and I found some miniatures from a game called Flintlock. Flintlock, which I bought in something like 96, 97. Now, Flintlock is a a very old skirmish uh, miniatures game, uh, which, as it says on the tin, sold by alternative armies and involves elves, orcs, zombies, dwarves, ogres, and many others fighting with muskets, pistols, and cannons in the Napoleonic period. And these things are not OOP. And in fact, there is a winter mega event on as of, well, until the 3rd of December 2021. So you can still get them. So I had a rummage around the uh, storage area and found about 30 or 40 of these miniatures, which equates to about 100 quid on the website currently. And I thought to myself, how can I be leaving these in boxes? And, you know, they're not well painted. I mean, they're basically a window into what my painting was like in 96, 97, 98, I suspect. But I thought to myself, there must be some use for these. Let's see what we think about uh, the silver bayonet as an outlet for actually getting these onto the table. And so I based them, um, as you can see, uh, although that I... I they will need to be touched up, and uh, well, that is a question. Do they need to be touched up? And then um, they'll need to be based with all the usual modern fun stuff, you know, and um, tufts and, and and games workshop kind of uh, grass and all that jazz. No prizes, of course, for guessing who uh, your man is based on. Five rounds, no more, no less. You'll shoot officers and NCOs. Then when you count your ammunition, every man will have 13 rounds left. Fire in your own time. But before we dive into that technical question of uh, transferable skills, so to speak, of my flintlock collection, um, let's just have a very high-level uh, sense of what the silver bayonet is about. So... There's beautiful artwork in it, as ever with these lovely Osprey books. It's about um, the soldiers of Napoleon on whatever side, you know, fighting beasties and nefarious evil um, in, in kind of little uh, investigative parties. And you can either play uh, kind of solo or you can uh, fight each other over various uh, challenges with these beasties as the kind of third invisible party. The Ancien Regime that fell to the revolution are, of course, uh, a long line of evil vampires, which, as I understand it, is a tad unfair because I haven't quite managed to get through Simon Sharma's fantastic history book, Citoyen, um, largely because there's just too many very big words in it. But as I understand it, um, his his thesis is that uh, the Ancien Regime wasn't that bad. It was reforming, and at the point at which they decided to start reforming to make its life better, a bunch of nutjobs decided to sort of take over the country through a violent revolution and caused several series of, of terror and killed loads of people and started a mass war with the rest of Europe. But anyway, that's just one thesis. 
back to Napoleonic horror, apparently it is an established genre, albeit quite small. You know, there are novels about vampires running around the snowdrifts of uh, Russia during Napoleon's long and very upsetting and painful retreat from Moscow. I've always thought that Sex and the City 2 was the worst movie I've ever seen in the cinema, but if I were ever forced to watch this, I think I might slip my own wrists with those swords. When the book was first mooted, uh, The Silver Bayonet, loads of people said, oh, that's just, just, you know, that's just like The Brotherhood of the Wolf. But I can't remember what The Brotherhood of the Wolf is about because when I saw it, I saw it in a cinema in Russia, dubbed into Russian, which I found very hard to follow. And all I really gathered was um, that it's about a big, scary wolf um, running around killing loads of villagers. These two investigators get sent in and largely spend their time kung fu kicking the locals. But reasonably inspirational for a, a Napoleonic, or at least revolutionary, gothic war game. You select a crew, uh, you get your officer, who gets to choose a few particular attributes which make them special, a few particular weapons which make them special, and then you get a hundred creds, whatever you want to call it, which you can then spend on people. I won't show you what the the, the, the values are, but um, these are the, 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 the people you can hire for your, or I suppose bring onto your um, mandated uh, team that's going to go in and find the evil beast of the uh, Baskervilles. You can get an artillerist. Uh, I think their their key thing is they can take a piece of ordnance they find and use it. Champion of faith. Slightly better classes of infantry in the form of a grenadier or a guard. As you can see, um, there are restrictions for the different nations as to what you can get. Some uh, nations can get some. The Brits seem to be able to get most, but then again, they had the empire, so of course they, they deserve that. Because, you know, of course, the Russians, whose empire stretched across an entire continent, couldn't have had access to all these different troop types. But the Russians do get the weir bear. And frankly, those of us from a kind of GW kind of background do expect there to be, you know, a reasonable difference between the factions. Whereas people from a more historical background understand that fundamentally, these are all just dudes with a musket. You get heavy cavalrymen light cavalrymen, bog-standard infantrymen, irregulars, which you can see there, you know, Spain and Russia for the guerrilla, whatever it's called, the war in Spain, courageous junior officers ready to just leap into mayhem for glory and progressive leadership skills, uh, marines, the light cavalrymen there, a rifleman, native scout, occultist, sailor, a sapper, a swordsman, a supernatural investigator, and uh, the big clunking fist and right hand man or woman to your uh, officer being the veteran hunter who you can equip. Um, and arm them to the nines. And you're basically looking at, uh, points-wise, I think, between you know five and, and eight people, uh, along with your officer, depending on whether you go for uh, useless people, kind of infantrymen, or the more specialised heavy clunkers. And so, spoiler alert, you can totally use your uh, flintlock miniatures for this. Um, you, you know, loads of individual characters. Um, a lot of these troop types, you know, fall within certainly my elf French collection and my uh, orky British collection of not many miniatures, but you don't need more. You know, you need an officer and between five and eight dudes aside. My super quick flick of the combat system suggested, you know, if you've seen a few of these Osprey games uh, or these uh, McCulloch games, you know, the, 
the mechanics for you know combat and shooting won't be wildly new to you. Um, there's an interesting mechanic that reminds me a little bit of um, the older version of Games Workshop's Kill Team, whereby you know you roll for initiative, the mate, the, the guy who wins, um, the guy or gal who wins, uh, gets to move um, half their team, and then the monsters uh, will come on to uh, all get to move. And then the second player moves all of their dudes, and then the first player moves those of their dudes who haven't yet moved. Um, so I'd be interested to see how that uh, pans out. I imagine it's been heavily play tested and it works. You have these scenarios, and we'll touch on one in a moment, but uh, you place these um, clue markers around the table, and you, oh, you're going to get points for finding what you're, you're after. Um, but you draw a card. You only have, I think, like half a dozen cards. And um, they correlate with what you find underneath the clue marker. And you might find the special artifact you're after. Or you might find some horrid creepy that decides to just attack you. Or something that sort of just creeps your guys out and makes them need to take a panic test. The monsters uh, follow a kind of algorithmic um, AI type um approach to what they're going to do, depending on what, where they are, uh, which is a mechanic vaguely, I mean, much more sophisticated, but not too dissimilar, I thought, to Dracula's America. You know, nothing, I haven't read these, but, you know, I think they're simple. They're, you know, if the monster's holding a gun and you're the first dude within line of sight, it shoots you. If you're, if the monster is nowhere near anyone, it moves towards the nearest person, I'm imagining. And if you are the nearest person dumb enough to have got into range of a terrifying melee monster, it will charge you and rip your head off. Again, not too dissimilar to Dracula's America. If you roll, uh, in Dracula's America, if you both pull the same uh, activation card from your deck of playing cards, weird beasties start to come out of the mix. And uh, here, similarly, if you, when you roll initiative and you roll a certain number, um, I can't remember what the number is, uh, you then roll on this unexpected encounters table to see if one of these various uh, creepies comes out of the woodwork. And to give you a sense of the various scenarios, so they're, they're, these games are more interesting than just running around shooting people. Um, you know, you've been hunting a changeling for a couple of weeks. You, you come across the farm, and the farm has eight bandits in there. Both teams, I imagine, try and kill the bandits. And when you kill a bandit, you draw cards until the point at which you've come, up, come across the changeling. I've no idea what a changeling is. I'm guessing it's some kind of evil, vampiric, toughy. And they um, then run around trying to kill you, I imagine. And I wonder what the scenario requires. Oh, I can't see it, but I imagine you get points for taking out the changeling. So, on to my old flintlock collection and its relevance to the aforementioned character types. So for our British flintlock uh, crew, we're going for one officer who's clearly going to be sharp over here with his heavy cavalry sabre. Not a gentleman's weapon, of course, but, you know, enough to bash in the heads of less the French, perhaps, than his own posh superiors, but that is the nature of the genre. His rifle... Um, and I can't remember what I use for the other slots. They get six slots, officers do. Then there's going to be a rifleman. I mean, this is actually a rifleman officer. Probably one of the characters from the books, but I can't remember which one he is. That's his name, and I can't remember why, but he doesn't seem to have real teeth. And he has an eye patch, and he wears a wig, and he takes all of these things off in combat for terrifying effect. So, I guess the orc doesn't get any friendlier. And unfortunately, his rifle broke. Now, do I judge alternative armies for that, given that this fellow was bought in about 1997? Not really. And had been in many boxes since. So, uh, and I thought to myself, well, can you guess where that's from? 
Oh, the joys of a well-stocked pits box. Of course you can. And nothing that a bit of pinning and super glue can't resolve. And I'm thinking maybe yellow or some spot colour just to add a bit of fun. I mean, why can't a Napoleonic crew searching for Nosferatu have some kind of long range evil musket or rifle aimed at taking said creature out from afar? One member of another crew, allied crew, and in Flintlock, the Dark Elves were Spanish, and this is a guerrillero, or whatever they call them, with his musket. I mean, you can see all the telltale signs here of painting from the late 90s. You know, remember, there was no internet. You couldn't just see how people did things. You know, if you wanted a, a guidebook on what the uniforms were like, you'd have to, like, buy one or get one from the public library. Um, so, do I bother re... I mean, this is, this is just dry brushed. You know, the highlights just madly and wildly go up without thinking, you know, would this hat be gleaming in that way? I mean, look at that. It looks quite cool and fun, I suppose, from afar. But I think if I do bother going over these a little bit, I will mute it. And you can also tell in those days, I just thought it was a great idea to just use vast amounts of thick varnish. Um, and so they kind of gleam in the light. But do you know what? Is that so bad? That's probably how they survived all these years. But I mean, look at that. What was the point of that dry brushing? You know, you dry brush rocks, you don't dry brush cloaks and clothes like this. You know, what I do these days is overbrush. So, and also, if he's supposed to be Spanish, you know, would he be walking around in this boring grey thing? You know, we should go for, you know, cool, reddish, yellow, bright, a Spanish kind of colours. So maybe I'll give him an orange cloak, maybe put a few, some kind of pattern on. I mean, that uh, Day of the Dead little thing there on his shoulder, you know, would it be white? It wouldn't be white, it'd be gold. So we'll see, we'll see when we repaint. And then um, two soldiers. And I got the, the braiding wrong. I think it's basically blue underneath and in the crevices and white. So that's one thing I might repaint. I don't think the basing size makes too much of a difference, except obviously the more base you have, uh, the more scope there is for zombies and creatures accumulating around you, all the worse for wear. But frankly, if you get to that point, you're probably a goner anyway. So does it matter? And who cares? He is going to be the veteran hunter. Armed with a pistol, a sword and a musket. And again, you can sort of see back in the day. And it never occurred to me that you kind of highlight around the edges where the sun might glint off. The sun's not going to glint off multiple parts of a flat surface of a hat, unless someone has thrown the hat in the ground and crumpled it up, which shouldn't be the case here. And also, you can see that some of the colours, like yellow and red, needed to have, if you undercoated black, you needed to undercoat again in white um, to give it the kind of brightness. But that's probably too glinty for material from the Napoleonic era, so I might go for more of a mustardy yellow if I can be bothered. So that would be the orcs. Right, vive l'empereur. We now turn to the Ferrach Empire, which basically translates to the French. And crikey, some of these are uh, really old. I remember getting the, the, the first box set for Flintlock. It was incredible. I remember um, 
walking to this, it was when this gaming store wasn't even in uh, a shop, it was just part of this market, and they would have their little stall, and uh, they'd got these, they'd got the box set, and the guy opened it, and he said, you know, I think if I open this and show you, you'll just be so impressed, you'll buy them, and I thought, well, you know, I'll get my pocket money, and, and I will. I think it was just a box of ten of these, are they called voltigeurs? kind of French light infantry, but no, but muskets rather than rifles. Um, and I was so impressed, but that means this is probably painted probably like 1996. And again, you can tell these kind of very insipid colors, black lining, no real understanding of highlighting, but you know, the colors are all there. And then these I think came out slightly later, a year or two later. So I haven't point costed this properly, but he would be the leader, the grand fromage, the big cheese, And I'll probably sort the boots out so they're not kind of glinting. I mean, they're not going to be polished leather. Well, maybe they are. Um, this guy would be a... Um, I think you can get guard units, guard infantrymen, which are slightly better. And he'll have a two-handed weapon there with an axe. But he's obviously a very large dwarf with a Bavarian helmet. He's a sapper. And again, you know, if I go over it, I'm going to tone down these blue highlights. I mean, this really is just um, a telescope into the past of my painting. People used to walk past these if I uh, took them out and go like, "Ooh, wow, but that was the days before the internet and before anyone realised exactly how you should paint. That guy's going to be an artillerist. I think I've said that to infantrymen. And then this dude... And this dude, I think they're going to be a heavy cavalryman and a light cavalryman. Because he's got a, is it cuirass, that is the word for it? A little bit of chest armour. My 25 year old flintlock collection even gives me some bandits, which seem to be, you know, quite key to many of the scenarios you don't only have uh, you know your plethora of trolls and zombies you also just have dumb human minions acting in in league with the undying the game also calls for bandits because you um as i understand it you place these markers around you draw a card and they either are the artifact you're after or they transpire to be some kind of grim beastie. And I've got plenty of grim beasties, like, you know, trolls and things like that. And, and you know, the the undead and zombies and things. Although I've only got human zombies, but who cares? Um, but occasionally the card you pull shows a bunch of, you know, armed bandits. And uh, these will be the armed bandits because they are... Um, uh, supposed to represent, I've forgotten his name, Obadiah something. I'll look it up in a moment. But Obadiah something in the Sharp novels, who um, is some kind of escaped uh, British soldier who, who didn't like the discipline and sets up with a bunch of rogues up in the Spanish hills during the guerrilla war against Napoleon's French in Spain. And... Uh, and so uh, in this little fantasy setting, he um, he gets a motley crew of randoms with muskets to steal and live a life of Riley up in the mountains. And this is what these guys are. So they are perfect for bandits. Obadiah Hakeswell, that's it. Hakeswell. Is this how the English treat their allies? We follow no flag, Missy. English, Frog, Portuguese. We fight for ourselves now. Good. On to the best of the rest. Comically, the uh, Portuguese are these little goblins, and I think in the silver bayonet, goblins are a particular baddie who can be equipped with muskets, but I'll check that. Those guys are... More 95th rifles, orc rifles. And that dude, I think, is some kind of 
British Orc Guards Regiment. So ones perhaps for when the uh, crews, no doubt, expand and get experience. Ooh, a campaign system. I mean, where would we be post Necromunda and Mordheim without some kind of ongoing injury table? I just hope it's not like the Gorkamorka injury table, where everyone in your crew, after about three games, goes mad and gets berserk. But all part of the fun. It does say madness there. On guard, he says. But the question really is, how far do I take this? So, I, you know, I, I pulled out these bases. I rebased them. I thought to myself, what bases do I give? Square. You know, this is a skirmish game, so no. Keep it round. Then I thought, you know, I've got all these lipped bases sitting there because am I going to use any more bases for War Machine? Can I be bothered to do anything with War Machine? Except perhaps, I mean, I must say, some of those uh, Kalor miniatures would be okay for the Silver Bayonet. But no, I think... We're finished with lip bases. Also, you know, for Malifo, do I need the brain ache? Not really. Um, and so I thought, let's use all those leftover bases I seem to have sitting there for these. Also, there's a, whenever you use a lip base, my sense is always, you know, it's a bit of an occasion. You know, you're saying this miniature is almost a little display piece. And there is something of that, I think, with these guys. So, uh, so I think what I might do is maybe make it my Christmas project. You know, just tart up a few of these. It's only sort of eight aside. And again, not go wild, because, you know, we've got to take a step back and think. Like that wise man on uh, Paint All The Mini said, you know, you've got to think how many times in the rest of your life are you going to use these minis in a game? And the answer is, if these guys see two or three games tops in the next decade, that will be good going. Um, and otherwise they're going to go back into a box. But then again... The other part of me thinks, you know, I'm trying to get everything out of their boxes and based at least and painted up for at least some kind of game and, and get them back to life. Because these have been sitting in a box. I mean, my mass isn't fantastic, but 21 plus 3 is 24 years. Almost 25. 25 years. I mean, there are probably people watching this who are younger than that. People who, when I bought these, either weren't around or didn't have full bladder control. So, you know... We'll have to be gentle with them. And they have reasonably stood the test of time in a very old hammery sense. And we'll see what the paint jobs look like when they're touched up. How likely is it will I actually get a game of this one day? Even if I go through all the trouble of prepping all these, uh, sprucing up all these various ancient miniatures? Well, I asked the person in my local gaming group most likely to play a game like this what he thought, and this was what he said. So I might have to work on him. Thank you for bearing with me to the end. You know what to do. See you soon.